there. Father, I ask as I always ask this at this time that you shine and that you speak. That you open up our ears and you open up our hearts and that you would glorify yourself somehow. This is your moment. This is your time. These are your children. This is your word. We're opening up our hearts for you. I love you. I thank you and I praise you. Let no one leave here not hearing your voice speak to them personally. Thank you, Father. It's in your name that we pray. And all God's children that agreed said, Amen. Amen. Um, we're celebrating Easter. Easter was two weeks ago. Celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is actually still called the Easter season. It stays the Easter season. Praise God. It stays that way until Pentecost when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. And um, I, I like this time because this time I get to look at the things that Jesus said after his resurrection is, is technically what we do at this point and try to look at it and try to figure out how it applies to us. Uh, last week, we talked about Jesus' first encounter with his disciples once he rose from the dead and how he challenged them to use their life to build his kingdom to further on his mission. And then the next week after that, he meets Thomas and he proves himself to Thomas that he rose from the dead. And then some time goes, a couple weeks actually, we're not exactly sure how much time, but some time passes by, Jesus is missing, he shows up while they're fishing one day and does this miracle by telling them to throw the net on one side and they catch fish and they've been there all night. And then he has this conversation with Peter and he asks him three times if he loves him. And it seems, so ba it seems so basic. It seems so easy to understand. But when you study what's going on here and you really try to get into it, this is one of my favorite verses to preach. And it's the most challenging too. It's my favorite because it stretches us to really ask certain questions of the scripture that we tend not to ask, that need to be asked, if we're going to understand what happened there and how it applies to our life today. It's also nerve-wracking because we really don't know. There are all kinds of opinions and, and conclusions of, from different viewpoints of what happened here and what it means that, that you could know. So on one hand, I like it because there's so much here. On the other hand, it's like, okay, what part do I share? Actually, I, was, I don't want to scare you because I think I've trimmed it down. But yesterday I was going over this in here and it was an hour and a half and I was still going. And I said, something has to go because there is a lot in here. But... If we're going to do justice to the scripture and truly find out what it meant to them, what were they experiencing? What, what, would they have, what did Peter understand when he walked away from that conversation? What did the disciples learn from the nets being thrown on the other edge, then on the other side of the boat? Then maybe you, where you are in your life this morning, can figure out what it means to you and then hopefully how you're supposed to respond to what it means and what God spoke to you this morning. And, and in order to do that, there are three questions, I believe three things going on in the scripture that has to be answered. Um, first, what's up with the fish, right? We have to answer why is there fish on one side of the boat and, and not on the other? Why were they out there seasoned fishermen fishing all night, not being able to catch anything until Jesus shows up and, and says, hey, throw it on the other side of the boat. Remember, it's a big net. They're not fishing with fishing poles. So before you could go on, you get, what does that mean? And then you got to deal with where was Jesus this whole time? Why wasn't he with his disciples? If you look at the scripture, Jesus was always with his disciples. Like every time there was a story with Jesus, his disciples were there. The only time his dis Jesus wasn't there is when he went off to pray. And we knew where he went. And he was only gone for a little bit, and then he would show back up. The disciples and Jesus were synonymous. And now he rises from the dead. And they're all by themselves. And the scriptures start sharing their life of what it's like when Jesus isn't standing there right with them. And I think answering, where did he go? Why did he go? Does that have anything to do with the story at all? And then the other question I think has to be dealt with is, why did he ask Peter three times? I mean, Jesus, do you love me? And it ultimately concludes, you know all things, right? And we were in Sunday school this morning, and, and one of the conclusions in Sunday school class is Jesus knows everything. Well, then, if he knows everything, why did he ask Peter three times? What was he trying to achieve? 
And I, I want to start dealing with those things this morning, but from the last one first, dealing with the love me part and work ourselves backwards. We have to ask, why did he ask him three times? And the thing about that that's interesting, we really don't know. There are a lot of speculations. The most common speculation that the theologians say that why he asked him three times is if you get on Google, you do any type of search, you're going to see this come up a lot. And that is Jesus was reinstating Peter and giving him confidence to serve. It wasn't that long ago that Peter had denied him three times. It started on the night of his betrayal. It started on the night of his arrest. There, it's on the night of Passover. They're sitting there. They're eating a meal. Jesus predicts that someone in that room was going to betray them and that him and he was going to get arrested and he was ultimately going to die. And where he was going to go, they weren't going to be able to follow. Peter steps up, says, I don't know about them, but it's not going to be me. I got you. I will go to my death following you. And then Jesus looks at him and says, ah, I'm not too sure about that, Peter. Matter of fact, before the night is over, when the crow th the cr before he crows three times, you will before he crows, you will deny me three times. Sorry. And Peter, even after hearing Jesus says that, sorry, I'm sorry, you got this one wrong. I am going to die for you. I am committed to you. I am 100% all in. And we know the story, that night Jesus gets arrested, it's not going down for Jesus like Peter thought. And he starts getting afraid, and some people recognize Peter, and they say, aren't you one of his disciples? Weren't you, you know, with him? I said, you're one of the close ones. And, and Peter gets afraid for his life, and he turns around and says, I don't know who you're talking about. This Jesus and I, we have nothing in common. I don't even know who he is. You, 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 it's not me. And he does it three times. And then, here it is, he rises from the dead. Jesus shows up, tells them, as the Father has sent me, now I've sent you. And Peter knows this. And is it possible that Peter is just feeling unqualified for the job? You can't use me. Look what I've done. I might do it again. I really don't even know things right now, how I feel about you, who you are, this is a mess, and you're asking me to do something, and I'm wondering if Jesus, this is what we're saying, is that Jesus shows up and knows this and says, Peter, he gives him, he gives him this opportunity to redeem himself. Do you love me? You know that I do. Feed my sheep. Because it's not what you've done in the past that matters, it's how you feel about me. It's where I stand in your life. Am I, are you committed to me? Yes. You'll make mistakes but feed my sheep. Do you not feel qualified, Peter? Great, because you're not. Feed my sheep. There's something special about Jesus and God, how he looks at us in all our failures, and he looks at us in, in all of our mess, and says, I still see potential. I still see someone that I could use. If, if Do you love me? Do, do, do I fit in your life in any sort of way? Have, have you, am, am I somebody to you? If I'm somebody to you, then, then great. You're usable. Because I tell you what, being called to ministry on any level is challenging and scary. After a while, you kind of get used to it. But in the beginning, right now, it's like, Pastor, you want me to do what? You want me to get involved? Do you know who you're asking? You, not me. It was just last week that I was denying Jesus, hanging out with everybody at work when they were blaspheming and talking about you and all this stuff. I didn't stand up because if I stood up and defended you, I'd look bad. And I don't want to look bad. I, I don't want to lose my job. So I just let me just let me just be quiet here. And Jesus looks and says, if you love me at all, if you have any affection for me, if I play any role in your life, I can use you because it's not about how great you are. It's not about how awesome you are. And it's not about how qualified you are because none of us are qualified. He doesn't call those that are qualified. You know the, the, the statement. What does he do? He qualifies those that he, he calls. Peter, do you love me? Yeah. Feed my sheep. We're all inadequate. We all fall short. But we can all use our lives for something greater than you're using it for now. We could all use our lives that let a lasting impact 
on somebody else getting into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is bigger than you just getting in. The kingdom of God and rising from the dead is bigger than just you knowing that one day you will rise from the dead. The kingdom of God is now about you helping somebody else see what Jesus Christ did so they can rise from the dead too. Here's Peter. He sees Jesus rise from the dead. He knows this story is true. He's convinced that this story is true. He knows that one day when Jesus comes back and that trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised and he's going to be one of them. And now Jesus is like, do you believe that? Yeah. Then how about getting somebody else involved in this thing? Stop living for just yourself, Peter, because this isn't about you. It's about me. Do you love me? Do you care about me? Am I somebody special to you? Yes. Time to get busy. Some say no. Some say no, that's not really what's going on here. It could be, but they turn around and say, it's not about reinstating Peter. It's about checking the quality of Peter's love. Does he love him in the right way? Do you, do you love him? Maybe he's, he, they're saying that he's asking Peter, does he love him enough to do something that he's asking him to do? It's not about being reinstated. It's not about being qualified. It's about, you said you love me. Is it enough to use your time, your gifts, your efforts, your talents to connect other people to the kingdom or at least care for the people that are already in the kingdom? Do you love me? Yes. Feed my sheep. You love me, right? And he's, yeah, I got to feed my sheep. I don't know if you really get this. Do you love me? And, and to really get a grip on why they come to this conclusion or why many of us will come to the conclusion, Jason was touching on it a little bit in, in senior Bible study this morning when he brought up the word love in the Bible. I had to leave because I was like, he's going to ruin my whole sermon. You, you know, I got to get out of here. I'm going to be tainted. <laughs> and it is because in the Bible there are different words for love because love has many different meanings in English it has many different meanings but we use the same word for all of those meanings I can love my wife I can love chocolate same word she can love me and she can love her cat same word I'm hoping It's not easy because the way she treats that cat, I'm like, I'm sure if she actually means it in a completely different way. <laughs> but in the language that was being used here, he did not, neither one of them used the word love as we know it. Jesus used the word agape, which is a different love than the word Peter was using. When Jesus asked him, he said, do you agape me? Peter then in turn said, you know, I phileo you. Basically, agape in its simplest forms is a committed, unconditional, dedication, all-in type of decision about that particular person. It's the word used in John 3.16 when he says, for God so loved the world. God so agape the world. God was so unconditionally committed 100% all in with the well-being of the world that he created, that he was willing to go all in to redeem that world. Agape, 100% commitment to, doesn't matter what the person does, it doesn't matter how I feel, it's not an emotional thing whatsoever, it is a decision. Is this supposed to be the type of love that someone has for the person when they get married? Although we know in 2021, that is not why we get married. We get married for the phileo or the eros type of love. Because how that person makes me feel. When I'm around that person, I feel good about myself. So you marry them. The moment they don't make you feel good about yourself, you're out. I am not in love with you anymore. Agape isn't something that you could be in and out of. Agape is a condition that says, I'm all in. When you say phileo, you're talking about a brotherly type of love. The type of love I have for everybody inside this room. I tell you all the time, man, I love you, brother. I love you, brother. And I mean it, but I'm not telling you agape. I am not 100% unconditionally committed to your well-being, even if it costs me my life. I don't know if I like you that much yet. 
Not sure. But do I love you like a brother? Sure do. Do I care about you? Yes, I do. Am I concerned about your well-being? Yes. I just don't know if I'm willing to die for it. Does that make sense? So when Peter looks at, when Jesus looks at Peter, he says, are you 100% committed all in with me? And Peter says, you know, I love you like a brother. Which should have solved the problem. But Jesus didn't, wait, wait, I, wait a minute, let me ask you one more time because you may not have understood. I'm asking you, do you agape me? Are you 100% all in committed to me? And Peter says, you know, I love you like a brother. I don't know if you heard me the first time. And then Peter questions him. I mean, Jesus questions him if he even loves him like a brother. Because the third time he doesn't use the word agape. The third time he uses the same word Peter uses. And he says, all right, you said you love me like a brother. Do you love me like a brother? Is that even true? And that's when Peter remembers the conversation he had with him and the Lord's Supper when he said, I will never leave you. I will die for you. And Jesus said, "Ah, that's not how it's going to go down. And then he, Peter says, yes, it is. So he says, do you love me like a brother? Jesus is like, uh, uh, you know how I feel. And then Jesus says, fine. Whether you love me like uncommitted, unconditional, all the way in, or you love me like a brother, either or. If you love me at all, in any sort of way, feed my sheep. If you're all in, half in, part in, standing on the edge, if you just think you're dying and going to rise from the dead. If the bare minimum of your faith, Peter, is that when the trumpet sounds, you're going to rise from the dead. If that's where anyone in this room stands, that's as deep as it's ever going to be. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. You don't have to be 100% all in. You don't have to be as deep and committed as the next guy. Because if we continue to compare ourselves to the person next to you, you ain't ever going to do anything. And Jesus is like, just love me enough to do something. Where do I fit in your life? How valuable am I in your life? And if I'm valuable at all, if it's even just a little bit, Peter, feed my sheep. Do something. He's basically telling everybody, no matter where you're at, you can make something of your life. You can do something more than just sitting on the couch all day long and all night long. You, you, you can do something more than just going to work, get up, come home, eat dinner, take a shower, go to bed, wake up, go to work, come home, eat dinner, take a shower, go to bed, take the kids to t-ball, take the kids to soccer, do this, do that, do the other thing. You can, oh, you can have some lasting impact on somebody's life if you just love me that much. Amen. Some say no, that's not what he's talking about. It sounds good, pastor, but no. He's not asking the quality of his love. He's, he's asking the depth of his love. How, how deep is this love? How, what, what type of love is it as far as quality is concerned? And you see that from the first line. See, when Jesus first asks them, they're focusing on verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these. And that shifts everything. Because now they're focused on, what, who, what does he mean by these? Who are the these? Because it isn't just, do you love me? It's, do you love me more than these? So, on one hand, it can be interpreted, do you love me more than they love me? It can be interpreted, do you love me more than you love them? And it can be interpreted, do you love me more than the fishing equipment sitting at your feet? It's, it, you don't know because it doesn't tell us. But if it means, do you love me more than the other disciples? It has a value. You love me more than them? You're, you're more committed than the person next to you? Then you know what? Feed them. They need you. Because they don't love me like you. They don't care for me like you do. What was it last Sunday? Jason had shared a couple of times, I believe, in his testimony that when he, he first got saved and he was he was so passionate about Jesus that he was going to church to church to church. And he, he just felt like he couldn't find anyone that loved Jesus. His conclusion from the way I got it was he was the only one. I love you more than everybody else because I'm looking around and nobody loves you. Great, Jason. Feed them. 
Because they don't love you him like you do. Show them the quality of that love. Show them what it looks like. Help them move from that level to the next level. Help them go all in. Help them see how lovable I am. Don't judge them yet. Don't, don't, don't deal with that. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to help them. Do you love me more than they do? Instead of looking back and saying, I can't believe anybody can't be as committed as I can. Well, then get busy helping them get that committed. Maybe that's what he meant. But we don't know. Even in another conversation with Charles, Austin came up at times that when he first got saved, he was committed to learn the scripture. Does anyone remember that? I, I mean, I was in the scripture and I studied, and that is a walk in Bible dictionary. I am intimidated on how he could recall not just what the Bible said, but where it was said. You know what that means? Help somebody else see the value of that. Don't just take that word inside your heart as it's for you. No, you got that Bible in your head. Start telling everybody what it says. If you love me more than they do. Do you love me enough to study that word? If you love me enough to know that word, if, if you love me enough to go to that level, don't let it go to waste. Some say, no. That's not what he meant. Some say he was saying, do you love me more than you love them? And that's easier to do, isn't it? I mean, it is easy to love God more than it is to love other people, because to be honest with you, some of you are unlovable. Has anyone ever been in church with someone that you didn't like at all? Don't, don't, don't look at, don't turn around. <laughs> don't turn around. I know I have. In 15 years having to pastor people, there were some people that I enjoyed pastoring. I, I just looked forward. I, I, I look forward to talking with CC, and it just, it just makes life easy. You don't have to really tell him much. He already knows he's committed, and we can dialogue back and forth. You know, really easy. And then there were some people in my day that was just like, man, you're really stretching me. I wonder if that's what he's asking him. Do you love me more than the other disciples? I know you have to put up with them. Andrew's your brother. He probably gets on your nerve. You, you know what I mean? John keeps talking around and running around telling that he's the one that Jesus loved. You know what I'm saying? There was two wanting to sit on his right and the other one wanted to sit on his left. And I mean, there's some power play going on at times. And do you love me more than you love them? Yeah, you do. There's people you don't like. Feed the people you don't like also. Because this isn't about investing in the people you love. This is investing in everyone because I've called you to love everyone. Remember, I didn't call you to phileo them like a brother. I didn't called you to be committed to them. I called you to be dedicated to them. I called you to be all in with them. So whether they're lovable or not, whether they're hard to deal with or not, would you feed them? Will you care for them? That's a tough one, isn't it? And there was a, a guy named, probably shouldn't say his name, I won't say his name, but he was in the other church. He was really, really hard to deal with. Oh, one of them narcissistic people that thrived on making everyone around him uncomfortable by the things that he would say. Just very uncomfortable person. You know, for guys, only guys will really know this. You ever been in a room, bunch of guys, and as that one guy starts bragging how much he knows karate? I know it sounds stupid, but you know what I'm talking about. It makes the conversation so uncomfortable. I don't care. Are you, are you wanting to fight? Like, I don't understand. I don't care how many stripes you got on it. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's like sitting around nowhere at all. And I say, hey, I benched rest 335 the other day at the gym. And, you know, you're like, uh, yeah. It was just, just uncomfortable to be around. And, but I had to love them. I had to care for him. I had to help him try as best he can. And you know what? It's a good idea if you stop doing that, Michael. You'd have a whole lot more people standing around you when you walk in the room. Some say, no, it's not. He didn't mean that. He meant the equipment. And when he said, you love me more than these, he was, pushing, he was pointing to the nets and the fish. Remember when Jesus met Peter, what was their first conversation? 
Let down your nets. Come follow me. And I'll make you a fisher of people. I'll make you a fisher of men. I'll, I'll change what you're doing with your life. I'll change the direction of your life. I'll give it value. I'll give it, I'll give it sustenance. I'll give it a, something eternal. And what did Peter do? Yeah, dropped his neck, followed him. The moment Jesus disappeared, the moment Jesus wasn't sitting right there in the boat with him, the moment Jesus wasn't there to guide him and to teach him and tell him what to do, what did he do? I'm going fishing. It was just a few weeks later, Jesus shows up in the room, shows him his hands and his feet. They touch the sides and he says, as the Father has sent me, I now send you. Breathes on them the Holy Spirit, tells them the message. He didn't just say, go into all the nations like Matthew. He says, as the Father has sent me, that same level of commitment that I had to give to God is what I'm asking you to do for me. And where was he? Fishing. So some say that's what Jesus was more upset about the fact, wait a minute, I'm asking you to do something, but it's going to be in conflict with some of the other things in your life that you love. Will you let them get in the way? Oh, now, now the sermon takes a heavier toll. Because at this point, we wonder what is in my life that's keeping me from doing what God asked me to do, and I'm not willing to give it up because I love it. That's a tough one, isn't it? I don't know if I used this illustration before. I hope not. But you, know, you say so many over the years, you just get confused who you said what to. But there was this one girl, she was started to attend the church. And she got saved like the first day. She ran to the altar. I'm all in with Jesus. And, and her husband was a non-believer. And um, uh, he didn't believe in God or anything like that. But he was coming to church with her because of her. And then we had to have, we were having Bible study. We wanted to do it in people's houses. So she opened up her house to do Bible study. And on Wednesday night, we would go into her house to do Bible study. So her husband was there. I was beginning to have a relationship with him and begin to share him a little bit about God and try to get him to see the reality of the resurrection. God was moving. And about three months. And then his spring came and T-ball season. And she said, you know, Pastor, we can't do Bible study at my house anymore. Well, why not? Well, because T-ball started, and my, I'm going to sign my kid up in practices on Wednesday. Let it sink. Think about it. God's moving. Your husband's a non-believer. He's going to hell. He's burning. He's going to be in the lake of fire. When the, when the trumpet sounds, he will be raised from the dead but not to the kingdom. He will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's the man you're living with. But you want to go play t-ball. So now I'm struggling now, because what do I say? Do I deny Jesus and the truth and just say, go have fun? Or do I use that moment to, to teach? So I, I, And I know it's risky, because if I tell any of you in here that, I'm in trouble. Because that's not what you want to hear. Because you love the net. The, the, the fishing is what you love. It's just, I can't give up the fishing. So I sat there and I said, you know, I don't think it's a good idea. It's your husband, this, that, your kids are involved. And do you really think t-ball? And I said, listen, you may not even not have to play t-ball. Why don't you just go tell the coach that Wednesday's not a good day? My son always played football. He never missed football his whole life. And I never missed Wednesday. There were times we would go to the football team and the coach is like, I think we're going to practice on Wednesday. And eh, Wait a minute. If you want to practice on Wednesday, that's fine. But my son's not going to be on your team. I'll go find the other team that does it on another day. And then he'd say, is that okay with everyone? And then everyone's like, yeah, Wednesday's not good for me either. And Wednesday, they were just people who weren't willing to stand up and say, Wednesday's not a good day. It's a bad day. The crow, the, the rooster crowed. <laughs> and they weren't willing to take, they weren't willing to stand there and say, I know this Jesus guy. And then always changed it. Never had to put him on another team, ever. So I was sharing that with her. Never saw her again. I'm the bad guy. It's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. 
Do you love him more than these? What keeps you from doing what you're supposed to be doing? What's on your schedule that's in the way? There should be nothing. My pastor taught me that. This one's the hard one. This one gets a little crazy, so bear with me. I, I accepted what he told me. Um, I was in the office one day, and I was just dabbling in ministry. You know, like I was just starting to become somebody in the church. And he called me in his office, and he said, I have something I want you to do. And it's, it's going to take this much time, and this is how I want it to go. Will you do it? And I said, Pastor, I love that idea, man. That's going to be so good for the church. That can't be me. I'm too busy. I got too much going on. So I told him. He said, really? It's only going to take about two hours. You know, one night, two hours, maybe a little bit of time. I'm busy. I had a lot going on. And there's where Pastor Casey was just, he hated me. He takes a piece of paper and he says, okay, show me your schedule. He said, he made seven columns. He put Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all the way to Sunday on the top of the column. He says, each one is your day. Fill in what you do that day. Put me the times. Put it all down, everything. If there's a time that you watch TV, put it down. If there's a time that you, you just sit around and stare at the trees, put it. I want to I, 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 I wanna, I wanna see if I can help you or maybe if you can help me. So I do. And he sees how I'm doing it. And I had it full. I was good. Poop my pump. <laughs> Busy. And he says, I don't even want to look at it. I said, why not? He says, because I saw how you did it, and you did it all wrong. Well, how do I do it wrong? You told me to put what I do. He says, this is what you do. He's taught a new one. He says, the first thing you put on that thing before you do anything is your non-negotiables. The things that have to get done, no choice. Your work, your job, right? That's a non-negotiable. You got to be there Monday through whatever, this time to that time, non-negotiable. He says, the other thing that you need to do is you need to be at church. Sunday, Wednesday, that's a non-negotiable. That's the first, the next thing you put down before you put anything else down. Wednesday, Sunday. He said, the next non-negotiable is your family. Show me the day that you're going to spend some time with your family, your wife and your kids every week. Put it down. Because if you're going to be one of them fathers that have no time for their kids, I don't even want to use you in ministry. Put it down. He says, now show me where you're going to spend time with your wife alone. One, give me once a month. If you can live with once a month, you can bear her presence, but once a month. Put it down. He says, now put down this ministry time. When do you want to do that ministry for me? He said, it was open. And he says, you can't put anything else down until you put that down. Because that's your next priority. Your T-ball is not your priority. At all. Your child will survive. I don't know how we got this far in life as human beings without T-ball, but we did. We did. It's an American thing. Somewhere along the line, you kids got to go out there and play T-ball. Just like the farce that they all got to go to public school and you can't teach them to yourself. What are you talking about? Who, who said that that's a necessity? Who said, and I, the part that I had to deal with is, there were some television shows that were really the problem. If I was being honest, it was the television shows and this computer game. I was addicted to EverQuest. I had to play EverQuest. And that was in the way. And I was challenged. I was challenged when he was, I was sitting there with him. And I was challenged to ask, do I love him more than these? I'm sorry. But it's gospel. It's real. There's no way around that. Do you love me even this much? Isn't that what he said to Peter? Do you, love me? Do you even love me like a brother? Then feed my sheep. Do you love me more than this stuff? And, and, and for me, he was only asking for two hours. It wasn't like some of you guys put some time in the ministry that if all you had to do was put in two hours, you'd be a happy camper. You're putting in so much more time. Some put nothing. And Jesus is challenging his disciples and he's challenging us as we read this. Will you put something in? Or is the net getting in your way? Some say no. That it's not that. Some say that Jesus was asking them, him, or trying to get him to see the urgency of the call. That's what I see. Actually, to be honest with you, I see all four. 
I see them all. I think they're all true. They're just different dynamic. But the part that I don't see many places is that he's telling him, so when are you going to get started? Let me see if I can paint the picture. Peter, do you love me more than these? I do. Feed my sheep. And Peter goes on eating. And Jesus is like, I don't know if you heard me. But Peter, do you love me? Yeah, you know I do. Feed my sheep. Gotcha. And he doesn't go anywhere. And then Pete, Jesus is like, <laughs> like maybe I'll have to ask him a third time, feed my sheep. Do you love me at all? When are you going to get started? Why are you sitting here eating? I said feed my, you said, I asked you, do you love me? You said yes. Matter of fact, you said that it was okay to even just say brotherly love. Even though it was brotherly love and it's not in all 100% committed to, do we, we, we're going to agree at least it's that much love. Feed my sheep. It's time people are dying. You saw me rise from the dead weeks ago. And you've done nothing. How many people miss the message of the resurrection because he was fishing? How many lives might have been changed if he would have started right away? We don't know. But you can look at it that way. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Well, get going. Come on now. I'm kind of rude with it, like, to a certain degree, because like, in the Marine Corps, in, they did it differently. In the Marine Corps, in Paris Island, uh, uh, before you can do anything, they had to tell you when to do it. Meaning, if someone came over to you and said, in the drill shot, you said, come here, Rico Bravo, I, I, I want you to pick that up, and I want you to take it over there, and then empty the bag, and do this, that, and the other thing. And then I would have to acknowledge, sir, yes, sir, I heard you. And then he would say, do it now, move. And you had to go do it. You couldn't do it. Even if he said, give me 25 push-ups. Sir, yes, sir. Do it now, move. And bang, you got started. And I'm wondering <laughs> if Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me? Yeah. Do it now, move. Come on. Why are you still sitting there? How many times do you have to hear a pastor tell you, you need to be involved in ministry? I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm not asking, you know, like he, Jesus is like, I'm not asking you if you agree that I should feed your sheep. I'm asking you, are you going to go feed my sheep? Are you going to go do it? When you graduated out of boot camp and you got to the fleet, the, the higher up in rank, they did it differently. They wouldn't say do it now, move. That's a boot camp thing. In the fleet, it was... It's really, it was rude. That's why I said I'm kind of rude at it because that's how it was. It was like, hey, listen, listen, Bill, this is what I need you to do. I need you to paint the parking lot and I need you to cut the lawn. Poof, disappear. <laughs> that's what he would do. That meant, he meant like right now. Like, you don't sit here, talk, don't check your pockets. You know what I'm saying? You know, don't go to lunch. I, rude. And they somehow made me a pastor. Go figure that one out. <laughs> I have yet to look in anyone and go, poof. <laughs> been thinking about it, been thinking about it. Man is the opposite. A man that I got to say, not yet. <laughs> it's so true. I had a conversation over one day. I said, you know, this would be a good idea if we did this and this and that and the other thing. It was just an idea. Next thing you know, it's all happening. And I'm like, what's going on? I didn't go poof. I didn't say do it, now move. <laughs> Have you ever promised to do something and you just never did it? Now is a good time to start. Some say, whichever one it is, he's really just trying to tell them how concerned he is about the sheep. That if it's the first one, second one, third one, it doesn't matter which one you ascribe to, whether you ascribe to all of them, you cannot not walk or you, you, you can't walk away not knowing that he cares about 
people. That he cares about everyone that is around you. He says, I know you love me, Peter, to do the impossible. I know you love me enough to walk on water. I know when I was walking on that water and you saw me, you had enough faith in me to say, if, I, if you ask me, I could come out to you. And I, he says, come, and you, walk, and then you walked on water. You remember that you loved me enough to walk on water? Praise God. I know you love me enough to be reckless. When you saw me on the side of the, on, on the shore, you didn't even wait for the boat. You just put on your clothes, jumped in the water, and started swimming. I know you love me that much, but do you love me enough to care for those that are around you? The people you like, the people you don't like. Are you willing to use your time, your gifts, your talents, your very own life? Because he tells him in the end, he's going to die. Doing it. Do you love me enough to do that? And I'm so thankful because he did. Because if he didn't, if he didn't, who knows where we would be? I know I wouldn't be rising from the dead because I would have never heard about it. But Peter took his words and he did. He went out there and he started doing it. And then Peter writes this letter we call First Peter. He writes two letters that we have in the Bible that we've, we've, we've made it to canon. That we call it the authority of scripture. This is it. This is God's words through Peter. And in chapter 5 of 1 Peter verse 1. Look what he writes. To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder. A witness of Christ's suffering. And one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Listen I seen Jesus. You've seen Jesus. I'm going to share in the glory to be revealed. You're going to share in that glory. You're going to rise from the dead. I'm going to rise from the dead. Praise the Lord. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers. Not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager. Eager. I know we don't like this word. To serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Makes a little bit more sense now after Jesus' conversation with Peter, doesn't it? Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Serve, be eager, not for the money, not for the attention, not for the spotlight. But because you know that one day there's this crown of glory. There's this, Jesus, I, I want to, I don't know about you, but I want to hear well done. I want to hear well done. You made some mistakes. You denied me a few times. I get it. I get it. But man, I can tell you about this person who's going to be in the kingdom. I can tell you about that person who's going to be in the kingdom. I can tell you about this person who didn't love me like he was supposed to. But because of your investment in their life, they started to love me more. And they started to reap the blessings of what it's like to love me. Would you do that? And then because of time, I'm only going to deal with one more. And that's not the love me thing. It's what's up with the fish? You can't end the sermon without talking about the fish. Because the, what happens with the net and the fish ties this whole thing together. Here are these guys, the professional fishermen, fishing all night long and not catching anything. It wasn't until Jesus shows up and tells them what to do that they start to catch any bit of fish. And the reality is there is nothing good that's ever going to come out of your life if you're not relying on the very words and guidance of Jesus. If you aren't looking for his words, if you aren't getting deep into that, show me, guide me, teach me, here I am. If, that is, if you're doing it on your own strength, making your own choices, decisions, you will always come up with an empty net. Now, you can take that on two levels. You can take that as for the mature in here that actually have a ministry right now that's involved one. I want you to know, do not do that ministry ever without going to Jesus each and every day, asking him for guidance, asking him for strength, asking him to what do you, what do you, what do you want me to do with this thing? How do I, I don't want to do nothing. I can't even walk without you holding my hand. I don't care how gifted you are. I don't care how awesome you are at your ministry. If you are involved in ministry, fall on your knees and say, Jesus, where do I cast this net? It's the only way you're going to catch anything. 
My pastor taught me that. I, don't, I think I understood him when he first taught, told me. But you, you grow in understanding sometime, right? He sat down in a room with me and he says, Pastor, you're so gifted. Robert, you're so gifted. We did a spiritual gifts test. Trust me. And it's not a brag. I'm off the charts on so many spiritual gifts. I'm everywhere. And he knew that. And he says, I want to, I want to, I want to caution you. Do not rely on your gifts to get you through. Rely on him to get you through. That's so hard because I can get up here. I can talk. I don't even have to write nothing. I can get up here and talk. But I, I'm t I, right there on my knees. The longer I do this, the scarier it is to get up here because nothing is going to happen. In, like, right now, no one will go to the next level if God doesn't do something. And if I'm asking God to do something that he's not involved in or not wanting to get a part of, that net is going to be empty. And they should not have been in that boat fishing. Just because it sounds like a good thing to do doesn't necessarily mean it is. Does that make sense? Now, if you're not involved in ministry and you're just walking through your life, I wouldn't pay a bill without checking with Jesus. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get a bill. I, I, you don't do anything without coming before him. You're not even involved in it. You're, not, you're, you're never going to get involved, right? You just know, I'm never going in. I, this is as far as I'm willing to go. That's fine. You make sure you rely on Jesus for everything. Everything. Because you cannot walk without holding his hand. You can try. You may look good while you're strutting down the road. You're just going to trip and fall when it's at the end. Get submissive and surrendered to the guidance and direction of the chief shepherd. Amen. Of the real fisherman. Because he said, follow me, and I'll make you a fish in a man. Follow me. Listen to me. We, we go through life way too often not talking to Jesus. Thinking, I said this last week, thinking we know some stuff. <laughs> what do you know? Come on. Really, what do you know? How smart are you? Like, you know what I'm saying? You got this? You got life? Do you? I have a feeling you don't. Come to Jesus. He'll guide your steps. It says, for the, the steps of the righteous man are ordered by the Lord. What that means is not the steps of the good person. A righteous person is one who says, Lord, show me where to walk. If you ask him where to walk, he will show you where to walk. You're not just righteous because you came to Jesus Christ. That's a positional righteousness that has to do with the resurrection. You could live righteously by saying, Jesus, do I go over here? Do I go over here? Too often I found myself saying, come on. I don't know, has anyone found themselves there? Say, come on, Jesus, this is where I'm going. Then it all falls apart and then you ask him to fix it. Come on now, somebody's shamed the devil. How many people have done some stuff? Thought, yeah, this is it, this is what I'm going to do. Come on, Jesus. And Jesus is like, I don't know where you're at. Maybe that's why he disappeared. He wasn't willing to go fishing. Or well, maybe he was willing, maybe he disappeared to see what they would do when he wasn't there. It's one thing when you're in church, right? Everybody, any man in here? You walk out the door, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? But I do know he shows up when you need him. They, at that moment when they need him, Jesus will show up. There's times in life where we're trying to follow him, but he just seems so far away. He just seems so gone. I don't understand it. I don't know why it is. It has something to do with our sinful nature. It has something to do with our fallen state. That he just sometimes seems so close. And then sometimes seems so far. Either way, you keep on tracking. Keep on trusting. And one day you'll turn around and you'll see Jesus standing right where you need him. Right where he needs to be, doing exactly what he wants to do, and doing exactly what he does best. Amen? amen. That was too heavy for everybody. Look at your neighbor and say, amen. amen. Come on, I don't see anybody's head turn. Your neighbor, the one you're supposed to not like, but love anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> Would you even notice when he shows up? That's another thing that I didn't point out. And I'm going too long. I'm going to close. Um, they didn't recognize him. I mean, it could just be practically that he was just too far off. And they just couldn't see. And it's not like we all had glasses. They didn't have pearl vision back then. 
Maybe they just couldn't see. Or maybe sometimes we get so far from Jesus, we don't even know what he looks like anymore. Can you tell when Jesus is doing something? Are you sensitive enough to say, man, Jesus is moving right there. Jesus is in that. Jesus is in that. Jesus is in that. Or when was the last time you've seen him move in any sort of way? Be grateful that God calls people. I'm going to close. Be grateful that God calls people to service and to feed a sheep. Be grateful that he takes a whole bunch of messed up misfits like you and I and is willing to do something great with no matter what level of love we have, as long as we have some. And there's a crown. There's a celebration day where every minute, every second, every sacrifice, every pain was worth it. Are you cooperating with Jesus? Are you listening to Jesus? Is your life characterized by doing the things that Jesus is calling you to do? Or is your life characterized by the things you're calling yourself to do? Are you looking for Jesus to show up? And if he does, are you willing to respond? Are you willing to make the change? Isn't God good? <laughs> I just can't help but think of the first one, not being qualified. If, you see, one of the things I had dawned on me some time ago, I don't remember where it came from, but it was, why does God use sinners to do great things? Have you ever thought about that? Why does God use broken people like Peter, like someone who denied him to save his own life? Why does he use people like that? Because that's all he's got to work with. So if you're feeling inadequate, you're in the right crowd. Because we're all inadequate. But he loves us enough to say, feed my sheep. <laughs> Amen. He loves us enough to, that your life has some value. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning and this time together. And thank you for whatever you spoke to your children this morning. I just hope and pray that someone got fed. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed day. Stay close to Jesus.